<laughs> like wow. a, like a proto rock steady. Yeah, that was actually. I, I wish they had used the sculpt uh, for the actual toy because it's much better than what they actually did. Is it is it from eighty five eighty six? Yeah, as is this. This is the the first turtle sculpt cast in some kind of resin. Kevin and I each got one of these. Oh, that's amazing! I see they kept that tail. <laughs> <laughs> The problematic yeah, tail. Yeah. <laughs> I was a kid at that time, and I know what I would have done with that tail, especially if it was art, had some articulation. <laughs> Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We have the great Peter Laird joining us today, and we're going to take a look through Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one. Jimmy, this is a this is a dream video for me, man. I'm very excited. We rarely ever do this. We've never done it, man. But I want to dedicate this video to two people uh, on the who have supported the channel in a big way, Alika Seki from Maui Comics and Eli Schwab, who runs some of our fan community, the giant turtles marks. They supported our channel in a big way. Alika sent us thousands of dollars worth of comics over, over the years to, to do episodes on. And I know they are over the moon for this episode, man. So I just had to give that shout, shout out. Peter, thank you so much for, for joining us today, sir. My pleasure. Have you ever done something like this gone through? Tur Turtles one with with anybody in, in this kind of molecular level detail. I have never done that, and I and I'm quite interested in doing it. Got to thank you so much for this deluxe edition. Uh, when you and I were talking, I was telling you how I liked um, this artisan edition where we get to see the sepia tone of the duo tone, how it's divorced from the black line, right. uh, and it's a it's a technique that I've used it for my own comics. And then oh, yeah. uh, you showed me this. Uh, you sent us these deluxe editions that you guys published in 1992 or so that basically it's the same deal you know yeah. like like printed in color so that you capture that sepia and what i like is the separation of that black line from the duotone board i think it's really a sexy approach and it's so cool that you guys had the had the foresight to, to publish such a thing yeah it, it it's one of those things that it never really occurred to me when we first did it, but as the pages started to age, that sepia tone came out even stronger. And it really occurred to us that it would be cool to have a book just showing how that looked, how the actual originals looked. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's probably up, to, like, it's probably state of the art at the time you guys put this thing out. And now it's the fidelity of scanners and things, like the, the approach that we got with these artisan editions you could get even deeper and see the undeveloped lines mm -hmm. with the duotone which is which is really cool you're about to say something jimmy i was going to say this this commemorative edition the deluxe edition it's almost like an artist edition i don't know 15 years or so before they do artist edition so it's mm -hmm. if, if you'd have gone bigger peter it may have been the world's <laughs> first artist edition do you collect those do you have all the kirby artist editions and things mm -hmm. yeah i'm sure <laughs> he's like dude i got i got the issues what are you talking about <laughs> So, uh, so this artisan edition is what we'll look at for um, for our TMNT issue one, and it's a really cool book. It has the thumbnails. Um, you sent us that comics interview interview that you guys did early on, and uh, it was probably the greatest uh, sort of um, showcase of of the delineation of, of of the the what do you call it, man? The 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 labor labor uh, mm -hmm. and. Eastman did the bulk of the original layouts, right. these, these pieces, but it wasn't like a autograph projector to um, put the final boards together. You guys kind of just eyeballed that. Yeah. And then uh, one of the questions that Jimmy and I had, well, Jimmy, you lay out the question, man. Yeah, so we have seen different, a uh, lot of reprints of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and one of the ones that's pretty popular were the first color editions. Uh, that mm -hmm. came out in the 80s. We saw them in bookstores. And what I noticed looking at those is that the ink lines are different in the first editions than in the black and white Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic, as if there were two sets of inked line arts. Hmm. We would take a look at, like, it would be stuff like uh, the the buildings. Like, there's the one thing with the turtle, like, with this. Like, somewhere on this page, like, if we grab that color one... Uh, we were looking at the bricks and there was some touch-ups and things. Oh, so, so, so how did that work with the, uh, the first comics? Like, like there's no duo tone on the first comics. Right. That was actually, uh, something that, uh, we did 
so starting in the beginning when we when we did the first issue, we would finish the ink art on the dual shade board. You know, after we penciled uh, enough tightly enough to start inking, we finish the inks, and then we take the pages and drive over to the next town over where they had a copy shop that had an excellent, really high quality black and white copier. Um, and we just make copies, full size copies of the originals so that we could have a, a, an archive of that finished inked art without any um, dual shade um, re effects on it. And then we would take the, those originals and do the dual shade stuff. And I can't remember why exactly we, we did that. But it, was, it probably had something to do with being worried that we would, if we went directly to the dual shade without making copies of the of the uh, finished inked art, we might ruin them or make big mistakes or you know spill the bottle of dual shade on the board, <laughs> and it would ruin the um, possibility of having imagery of that original art, inked art. For our, for our records, and it, it worked out quite well actually, because once once first comics uh, struck that deal with us to do the the graphic novel format color reprints, we had all those copies of the original art to give them, um, or to actually use ourselves to create the blue lines and and do the color that way. That's that's my introduction to Eastman and Laird's Ninja Turtles, the the color first comics collections, four of those. And they were in bookstores. Like I got that at the mall, at Walden yes. Books. They penetrated the bookstore market. Peter, do you have any sense of of what went wrong with first? Because something like that, they penetrated a giant market that they the the, the world could have been their oyster, but Pretty soon after, they just kind of disappear. You know, I, I I really don't know what happened with them. It was a, a good deal for us, I think a good deal for them. And, uh, you know, they never did anything beyond those uh, volumes that you, you have. I don't know why exactly. Yeah, they, like, it's pretty much the... They got, they got all the Eastman Laird stuff, I feel like, from that little early run before you guys start to do, like, your solo issues and things. Mm -hmm. Check this check this uh, page from the Xeroxes out where it's, in the final board, it's all duotone. So mm -hmm. so the guys left just a little indicator of, like, where this ninja will be kind of superimposed upon the image. That's a real sharp move. But without further ado, what if we just crack into the body of this of this comic? You know, you know, yes. Peter. What? Here's another question, man. Um, the, all this artwork here, like even early on, I think we get the cover somewhere. Yeah, the, here's the cover right here. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember years ago, Eastman on uh, the Heavy Metal website, he had a Photoshop image of himself with his pinky up against his mouth <laughs> like this, and was like one million dollars. He was trying to hustle. The, the, he was trying to hustle the, uh, the the turtles art for for mm -hmm. for for a mill. Like, you get five hundred grand of that if 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 that deal would have went down, is that how that kind of thing would work? No, uh, you know, we never actually uh, talked about that, but because we each, I think issues with issues one and two, we each took one whole book. Kevin got the first issue, and I got the second issue. And I I I would think that the fair thing would be that if he, if he sold his number one originals, he would keep all the money. And if I sold my number two originals, the same would be the case. Um, I don't think he managed to sell them for a million bucks. Uh, he actually offered it to me for, I think, 200,000. And uh, at the time, I said to him, I have enough turtle art. <laughs> I, I kind of regret that now. I, I would really like to have those originals. But say la vie. Yeah, when you think of what original art has has become in the last decade or so, wow, that would be quite a quite a prize that first issue. Yeah. I'd like to put it out to Kevin that I'll, I'll give him two hundred grand for <laughs> for uh, for issue one here. Peter, are these uh, some of the first pages you guys ever used a uh, craft tint duo tone for? I had done a little bit of work on the the duo shade board. I had been a, a illustrator for a while, and um, I had 
discovered that effect in some uh, uh, political cartoons, I think. Right. And I, it baffled me. I could not figure out how they did it. And then I, I, I can't remember where I found the answer, but I, I may have researched it at the local art supply store. See, and I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And uh, I did end up buying at least one sheet of dual shade board that I used for a few different illustrations that I did for the local paper. What was the price of that stuff, if you can remember back then? Because even in the 2000s, like it was eight bucks a pop. Yeah, that's what I remember. Eight being, it being eight or eight fifty a, a, a sheet. Damn. So even in the early eighties, like what, like what is that? Like twenty five dollars or something? 20, <laughs> you know, tw twenty bucks a sheet. Uh, yeah, was, it was not cheap back then. Was that a yeah. tough decision to decide to make the Turtles comics on a very expensive piece of paper like that? It was not a tough decision in the sense that we we didn't know what we were going to get out of it. Because it was pretty clear what we could what we could accomplish, you know, the kinds of effects we wanted to do. Um, it was it was tough ponying up the money for it. You know that that was significant for us. And I, we we did manage to get three pages out of each sheet. I right. think each sheet was like seventeen by twenty two, something mm -hmm. like that. But we ended up uh, the 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 originals aren't much bigger than the actual printed comic size. Yeah, and I'm quite sure that that uh, this book captures basically the size of of the paper uh, that mm -hmm. that the that the original boards are on. When you take mm -hmm. a look at these spreads, can you see your hand and like the pieces you inked? And can you see Kevin's hand? Oh man, that that is so tough, especially for the first issue. Yeah. If we were going to the second issue, I could pull out at least one page that I know I almost completely inked. And I don't know if you remember, there's a there's a page where there's a slender panel at the top and then a big panel at the bottom. And it's Baxter Stockman is showing April all his Mausers that he's created. Yes, sir. I'm pretty sure I inked most of that that array of Mausers. But if if I look right now, um, get close to this. These, you know, it's it's so difficult. And it's actually because, I mean, we wanted it to be that way. Sure. That our, our styles and our, you know, penciling and inking and toning matched as well as possible. What are you looking at? Uh, for the people at home, they're curious, man. They're like, man, is that dude looking at a first printing? <laughs> this, this is actually a, a second printing in pretty good shape. I, I keep most of the original comics, at least one in, in the house with me. Nice. Um, yeah, it's it's really tough to, to to see this, and and look at. I mean, I'm really having a hard time. Oh, actually, here. Um, this this, I think, if you can see this, I don't know if I'm holding it up properly. This tall panel, right here with the turtles. Yes. I think I inked that that panel okay but we we did luck out in that even though our styles are pretty different we managed to to blend them pretty well i think yeah. um oh yeah here's another one um can you call out uh, the page number oh yeah i'm uh, sorry uh page 24 boom uh and there's this this the city building, the yeah, this one right here. Wait, what am I doing? Yeah, I'm pointing at this one right, right here at the yes. bottom. Yes. That, that that looks like I inked the turtles and Kevin inked the building. Okay, that's perfect because <laughs> because I see I see differences, and it looks like like I feel like I could see where Kevin does the lettering, correct? Mm, correct. Yes. So you could see that there's like a bleed mm -hmm. at the edge of these letters, <clears throat> clearly like a fine liner or something like that. And you could see pen line on certain spots, but then you could see like a thicker, like a brush. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that was your tool of choice, the brush, and if he's more a fine liner guy. Like, uh, these, like these chains look like they're inked by the lettering tool mm -hmm. right here on page four. Page four. Yeah, the middle panel, you see some chains uh, behind uh, 
Leonardo and it looks like that lettering tool line. The size of those old turtles books is always interesting. How, how did you guys arrive at that? Sorry, what was that question? The dimensions of the first run of turtles, uh, how it was not quite comic book size, not quite magazine size. Yeah, that was kind of a doping mistake on our part. Um, we wanted to find a local printer who could print, you know, a, a book, a comic book, a newsprint inside and have a, a, a slick cover. And we, we found a local TV guide that was exactly what we were looking for, except that it didn't have the, the slip cover. It was all just newsprint. And we, so we found out where that was printed locally, drove up there, explained what we wanted. And uh, they said, oh yeah, sure, we can do that. And, uh, and they did, and they, they did a nice job printing. And it wasn't, it wasn't until we started selling them and people started complaining, hey, these don't fit in regular comic book bags. That would that had dawned on us that we had done it not the size of a regular comic book. It was just a stupid mistake on our part. It's funny. It makes it more of a collector's item because it's probably harder to to, to keep them in mint condition and to keep them with comics as a as a back issue. Yeah. What's, what's real funny is you just got to have a super successful comic, and then it never hits the the um, long boxes, right? Like you never see one in the wild. But uh, some future issues that I pulled for us to to look at was, um, I can't believe we didn't do this episode yet, but issue eight with uh, Cerebus. And in the back, uh, you guys are promoting that, what's it called, Ryan 99 or Ryan? Oh, yeah. Like, whatever that... Tri- Ry- yeah, 2099, That's what maybe? I thought, but it feels wrong. And that Ryan comic is about a half inch bigger than comics, and you see it in old quarter bins all the time, and you could it's a sore thumb because you could see that comic sticking out. No near mint <laughs> copies of that exist. All bent. Yes. Totally. Mm. Yeah, that Ryan 2990 or whatever it was called was done by our friend Ryan Brown, who did a lot of inking for us on the early books. Yeah, it's so cool. Like uh, Alika, who this episode is is dedicated to, he's got he's got a run. You know, he's got a run of of TMNT. We were looking through that thing, and uh, in I think it's like the re like this. It might even be that second printing of um of issue one. There, there's like a Michael Dooney letter somewhere. Like a, a lot of a lot of the Mirage guys, they have Fen letters in there. Also, mm. there's uh, Joe Zabel, the mm-hmm. Harvey Picar collaborator, is in uh, the super early letters columns. It's, it's real cool. Peter, do you remember if you worked like out of order on these pages? And the reason oh, I yeah. ask is the turtles look really good from page one, and mm. it seems like it'd be hard to figure out how to draw them. And to draw them consistently, so plus it's two guys, so it's like you know, do do you start off half the pages? Does Kevin Eastman do the other half when you start laying them out, and then just switch back and forth? Well, it was it was kind of organic the way we did it. Um, you know, the uh, <laughs> we used to call the less interesting pages the boner pages, <laughs> um, and you know, in terms of uh, when we would transfer the art to the to the do shade board free handing it from the layouts that kevin did we'd always draw the fun stuff first and then the the, the less interesting boring stuff second so if i would if i took uh, you know say pages one two and three and did my 50 percent of penciling on it um I would probably start with the really cool stuff, you know, the, the turtles gesturing or whatever, and then do it, do as much as, uh, you know, that would make it to be 50% of my work. And then I'd hand it to Kevin and he'd do the rest of it and vice versa. I can't remember exactly if, you know, what order we um, divided them in, in but it, it was generally the case that we would do the fun stuff first and leave the boring stuff left for last. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I also wonder, like this page that we're looking at here, it's Mm -hmm. so great, sort of like the black and white, and then you have white here in the middle and another dark panel beside it. Are you guys working those kind of compositions out together? Like, are you, you know, talking about, hey, this is a good looking page or let's have some white space here to break it up? 
you know, that would have been nice if we had done that, done it that way. But I'm, I'm pretty sure we just trusted each other to, to not, you know, wreck the, the composition by doing something crazy. Um, and in that case, the one you're pointing at right now, um, you know, that's basically just trying to balance the page with the, the two sort of strips of gray, dark gray, and then, then the white in the middle. So you try to get 50% of each man's contribution on the page. But when you crack open your very pungent <laughs> duotone chemicals, is it mm -hmm. one guy who's doing all the tones per page? No. So it's Not still 50% at that level, maybe. Um, well, the, the, that page you're looking at right now, the one uh, of the, the cityscape. Yes, I'm lingering on that for a reason, for sure. Um, that looks to me like that might have been just, just Kevin toning that completely. And I, I think I may have mentioned to you at that time we talked a few days ago, that that, was, that page there, that full page, was a, the source of, our, I think, probably our only argument uh, or disagreement when we made that book because Kevin wanted to have it in there and I didn't and we went back and forth and back and forth and finally I said oh okay and now I love it and now I think it's a great great page to have there I think it's, they even uh, mimic that yeah. in, in the first movie I think that's a beat whenever they beat up the guys in the beginning and, and mm -hmm. you see the hand and I feel like there's a pullback or something probably around that that era where you and you and Kevin are, are, tr are trash men uh, mm -hmm. in, in the background like <laughs> that I think that yeah it's it's one of those things that um, you know I've always felt from the beginning that Kevin had an excellent sense of pacing and I think that's an that's a great example of that where he, after all the action in the first few pages of the book it's great to have a, a beat where you, you just kind of calm down right before you go to the next page this is another page I was looking at a bunch uh, where I feel like you could just, you could see the hand of both guys reasonably clearly in a way, uh, because you got like this sort of bold outline with like pen on the interior of the t mm -hmm. the turtles here, and then there's this very noticeable like bold robe tunic thing that looks like it's just a different hand. Like like the bold outlines that are here are not the same tool that that was used right there. It just we look at comics molecularly these days, Peter. Uh, yeah. And certainly the collaboration that you guys have had is something that we've, we've studied mm -hmm. forever. Uh, that that uh, image of Splinter on the bottom panel and the panel just above it, that looks to me like Kevin inked that. Yeah. Um, and the right above that, the third panel down from the top, it looks like I probably inked most, most if not all of that. There are these these pieces throughout the the, the book uh, as we as we keep going where there are these like open panels things like this mm -hmm. and it makes me wonder if that Frank Miller Wolverine miniseries came out before this was that eighty one no, I think it was a little bit later but it before may have come out before this because uh, every page he would make an effort to allow like a good chunk of white space mm -hmm. on the page and I wonder if that played a part in laying out these pages for you guys yeah i think uh, kevin much more than uh, than me was a huge fan of frank miller and his work and especially his design work in terms of creating panel flow um and that that's something that he carried over into his layouts for this first issue and i think it worked quite well in, in various places i mean like the, that third panel down uh, from the left on the left hand page where the turtles are, are coming into the lair and meeting Splinter. You know, that's it's it's kinda nice to have a little breather there. You know, that and I think that he really Kevin did a fantastic job on all of the layouts he did. And even just cutting off some negative space here, mm -hmm. it abuses what uh, Steve Bissett would call the grid mm -hmm. or the or the, the square, the rectangle. Like it it plays around with that. The lighting techniques. See, this I feel like if you guys were moving in order by page eleven, you guys are comfy with that duo tone. Doing lighting mm -hmm. techniques from the window, and then doing the superimposed ninja behind mm -hmm. the ninja figure, like that. That that 
that signifies a little bit more confidence than maybe you had uh, yeah. at the start of the game. Yeah, I think you're right. Iconic. This stuff is in movies. Like, you got to pinch yourself, right? You guys are hanging out making this comic, and, you know, six years later, like, you have actors playing this out with a Jim Henson Muppet. Right. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that middle panel there in the bottom bottom tier of panels uh, where the rat is in his cage practicing. I remember uh, when we started working on the, the first live action movie and the, the Henson shop with the creature shop would send us videos showing, you know, what they've done and how far they advanced. And I remember specifically <laughs> they had this rat puppet they were you know showing him kicking and punching and it was just so cool. Mind blowing. Never, not, not something we'd ever thought we'd see. The uh, the re the Renaissance names was it was that was that Kevin, who came up with those. In in all honesty, I can't remember. The, and I wish I could the, because it, it it is one of the things about the the book, about the whole property that. that just kind of works, and I don't know why. The the reason I I ask about. I asked that way was because uh, my my sister's husband went to the same high school. They went to his high school much later, and uh -huh. there is still a Kevin Eastman painting of the Renaissance Masters, uh -huh. like above a locker. So there's hmm. like you know the Vitruvian Man and Mona Lisa and, and Renaissance imagery uh -huh. is painted up there, which you know in the history of your works like that it seems noteworthy. Yeah, you know, I actually, I think I saw that that image, and maybe not, I'm not sure if it was one of your videos, but definitely one I saw on YouTube. Yeah, there um, was there was that heavy metal. Uh, it was it was a kind of like this kind of book that that Kevin put together called the Autobiography. It was yes. called, yeah. Mm. But we we, bo we both were uh, students of art, and we both, I believe, had that classic uh, Jansen's History of Art, the big fat volume. Right. Covered almost all of that stuff. Uh, and like I said, I wish I could remember which of us came up with the idea, but it was one of the, just one of the, the several ludicrous ideas that we came up with that really seemed to work and fit. And I, like I said, I just, I don't quite know why, but it does. Would you ever run this duotone chemical through uh, an airbrush or anything like that? Spatter? <laughs> Uh, I I think I did some spatter, but I do remember that I did, did use it in an airbrush several times. Wow! In fact, I think in, in specifically the one that I can remember is in the uh, Donatello micro series. There's a couple of pages with a the the, uh, the drawing of the uh, the portal that Kirby drew and which stuck around, unlike the other things. And in the portal, there's these kind of wavy, wavy shapes and stuff. And I remember doing that with the airbrush. <laughs> the uh, the de the uh, the deluxe editions you sent us of, of issue one. Uh, there's a there's an intro in there by by Kevin Eastman. Or you know what? It might even be in the beginning of of this book. You know, you look at so much stuff. And is there an Eastman in there? Harlan Ellis. Okay, no, sure. it's in the beginning of this. Kevin <clears throat> says that the origin of the shredder came while you guys were doing dishes and he said ask me that story later so can, can you elaborate on that oh yeah um uh when kevin lived with my wife and i in the house we rented in dover um, very often she would make supper and kevin and i would take over the task of washing and drying the dishes and it was one night um and I should also point out that this was some night after both Kevin and I had read that horrible comic book, Great Man. I mean, uh, Skate Man by Skate Neil Man. Adams. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and we were washing and drying the dishes. And while he was drying uh, a cheese grater, Kevin took it upon himself to stick his hand up into the grater and hold on to the handle. And he's turned to me and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have a bad guy who had these on his arms? He would, like, break you to death. And uh, it's, it appealed to me. You know, it seemed like a good idea. And that's really where the shredder came from. That's amazing. 
now we got that iconic, you know, intro episode piece where it's playing on the the Daredevil Mm -hmm. origin. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I remember reading, you, you go into old comics journals and Amazing Heroes, and the reviewers, there's no language to describe what the Turtles is. Uh, so when it was being solicited, parody would be mentioned, satire would be mentioned. But when you read it, it's very straight up. This is almost like the closest you have. Of course, you got the foot, you got Splinter, yada, yada. We get that. But it's not parody in a traditional sense. It's not Harvey Kurtzman, mm-hmm. you know? But like this clearly is, you know, it's young Matt Murdock. Yeah. Yeah, the the whole parody thing... Um... It, it was, I think it was, like you said, uh, kind of hard for some of the, the critics to figure out what exactly the Turtles comic was, um, because it's not much of a parody. I mean, there are certain small elements that you could say, yeah, that's definitely a parody. But, uh, and especially as, as you go along uh, from the next issue and so on, um, it's, it's really a straightforward story told with a little humor. And the whole parody thing, I think, was was a misnomer. It's amazing to look back at this, and it feels like it's already destiny that these are toys, that these are cartoons and movies and multimedia, because it feels like such a showcase for that across this spread. Yeah. Yeah, like this could be the backer board. You could put the yeah. blister pack right there and glue your dudes in there. Peter, what do you think about the multicolor bandanas? Like, you guys come up with the red, and then when the cartoon happens, you got that multicolor and that's how most people recognize them. Do you, do you think that that was the way to go or you think uh, stick OG, keep keep the red? Well, the, the, the multicolored bandanas, that actually came about when we had our, I think, first visit with Playmates Toys out in California. And we met with them for several days and they were just looking for ways to en- enhance certain aspects of of the turtle property and tone down some other aspects and you know one of the things actually this is another kind of funny thing in 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 a way similar to the the thing where we didn't tell the printer that we wanted to print it on regular comic book size it took several maybe maybe not several months but at least a month after the first issue was released that we started getting fan mail and people commenting about the fact that, you know, you can't tell the turtles apart if they're not holding their weapons because we, we never thought that, you know, for us, it was, we knew exactly which, which, which one was which even without their weapons. And, um, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. Yeah. We're talking about the multicolor bandanas and, and you're yeah, yeah. meeting so, with them. So there, there we are at Playmates headquarters talking with them about, the, the variety of ways that we could figure out how to um, differentiate the turtles visually. And I believe I put forth the notion of the different colored bandanas and they, they um, suggested the uh, belt buckles. I actually have no problem with different colored bandanas. It, it's a minor thing. It makes total sense either way, you know, if they all had red or if they had multicolored bandanas. I, I have no problem with that. I linger on this page because it's another one of those pieces where the the aesthetic use of the duo tone is done masterfully with this soupy atmosphere mm-hmm. of the sky yes. and the lighting of these like little bungalow shack things, mm-hmm. calling to to mind focal points and just using all of the important illustrative tropes that we have at our disposal, things like this, man. Just very clear, you know, it's a very, very clear to, to, to read comic. Um, lots of stuff that you guys sort of uh, inspired when the black and white boom happens. Mm-hmm. Those guys leave those lessons yeah. back in art school. <laughs> Peter, we know a lot about, or we've heard, you know, Frank Miller is a big influence, and I think we see that in a lot of these pages. Do you mm-hmm. see other influences as we're going through here, um, artists that you were channeling or thinking about? Like, do you see any of that on, on any of these pages or panels? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, 
I, I can honestly say I've never actually studied it to, to, to try to pull out that information. Um, and and in, in large part, uh, I, when I go through this book, I basically see Frank Miller. Mm-hmm. You know, because Kevin, who did all the layouts, as you know, had such a fondness for the work of Frank Miller. And it really, it's so obvious. And I, I just looking at it now, I, I, I'm drawing a blank. I really can't, can't pull anything out like that. There's a bluntness to some of the inking and the squatness of the figures really makes me think of Corbin and mm-hmm. mm-hmm. in, in a lot of this. This is one of those little ticks, man, that I would be so, so surprised if Kevin did not ink this because it looks like totally looking one for one at like, an issue of Ronin, mm-hmm. like that era of inking. And we did an interview with uh, Dan Klaus where he said he would like ink some of his pieces with an artist edition open, almost putting his artwork on top of the artist edition if he wanted to channel a little Reed Crandall or a little mm-hmm. Johnny Craig into his story. And he would just like look at those lines while he's inking his own. And, and that looks very close to the instruments that that uh, Miller was playing around with. On, I think uh, you're Ronin. absolutely correct. Peter, did you guys do that? Would you have comic books laying around while you were working? Um... They, there were probably comic books lying around because we were, at the time we were into reading them and we, we, we would go, I think, every weekend or every other weekend to a local flea market where a guy had set up selling comics. Um, but I, I can honestly say, I can't speak for Kevin, but I can honestly say I've never had that kind of like direct one-to-one um, influence from, and, and had a comic book sitting next to my drawing table yeah. that I was drawing inspiration from. I might have done that, you know, offhandedly, you know, read the comic, see some cool effect that somebody created with, with their pencil or ink, and then try to duplicate that myself, never, never just having the comic right next to me and sort of looking at it and then drawing what I was drawing. I hang out on these two pages because uh, we're looking at terrain. Obviously, this is like a rooftop, so it's not exactly the ground. But just seeing the different marks you guys make mm-hmm. for the different sort of ground textures, real cool. Because that's clearly a pen mm-hmm. uh, that's that's used there, but real thick, chunky brush on that one. Yeah, I feel like I have material on my drawing table where you know, like you're trying to tip your brush, right? And it looks like these marks, yeah, some nightingale lines. <laughs> Iconic. I, I feel like this image is um, digitized in one of the video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this I exact so. one. Yeah, it gets. Uh, maybe, maybe it's maybe it's that arcade joint, like like the one that was in all the Chuck E. Cheeses. More Actually, of those that, great skies. That image makes me think of the first Shredder action figure. Yeah, yeah. The, the kind of weird, cre- crouching pose he was in. Yeah, man, that dude, uh, that dude who did that. He was on that Turtle Power documentary, and he's the guy who did all the OG designs for He-Man figures. Hmm. And he's like, you, you know, you squat him down, you give him a mystical pose. It, 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 it it's, it's actually a bigger toy. It's bigger than a three inches, but you squat him down, and it makes him look massive. Yeah, that's what it, you get. It's a cool idea, but you, you could almost never get him to stand up straight. Right. <laughs> he was always falling over. He was interesting, too, because uh, it's that it's dicey territory, man, when it comes to painting your the figures, like at the factory. It's like, do you paint the whites of the eyes or do you not? And he has the little polka dot eyeballs. He's got the, like the little, the little he, like Dondi. Remember the Dondi comic strip? He's got those yeah. those eyeball paintings. Do you, ha- do you have all those toys in your house? Like, like one of yeah. everything? Oh, oh. I, I have a few. I, in fact, uh, there's a there's a book, big bookcase right over there in front of me, and I have actually I had that's where I keep these these two guys, this guy and the uh, rhino, um, along with some other toys that I'm fond of, and um, four of them being the Star Trek turtles. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw those. Absolutely, had had one or two. Yeah, because I'm a big Star Trek fan, and it was kind of a, I, I mean, I never expected this to happen, but it was such a cool thing when Playmates uh, managed to get the permission from the 
Star Trek rights holder to to do those toys. That was a fascinating time too, because because Bar- Barbie would be the girls' version that would get licenses, and then it would be Turtles. You know, have like a Freddy Krueger Ninja <laughs> Turtle or something. How about that two page spread? Wow. Good depth, yes. like like the the the. the the use of tools, man, it's it's all here. You know, you got your big, thick line on your foreground mm-hmm. Foot Clan, dude. The textures that you guys would employ on the the turtles is always really, really cool, man. It just it made them feel mm-hmm. way more organic. Hmm. They just were never able to capture that, like on the cartoon or anything, because it's all the flat that flat color. But having these dots and these little textures just made them. You know, that's that's turtle skin. And that's one of the things the Duo Shade board was really great for, because you could get all kinds of effects like that. Yeah, there's different approaches. It's like Duotone could be used as like a color, where it's like jeans or you know the dark Duotone. It could be light. Uh-huh. It could be texture. It's it's very malleable depending on you know how you use it. It's so unfortunate that it's no longer being made. It's true. Did you ever get? Did you guys ever like when you're drawing these tails? You know, and it's right there in between the legs and stuff. <laughs> like, like, would you guys laugh about that, or, or just you didn't even think about any, per, like, uh, your your mind was never in the gutter with that? Because, like, look at that one. It's almost like there's a scrotum t- also. Well, again, this is one of those things that readers picked up on and made made fun of in various ways. But I, I can't speak for Kevin, or I shouldn't speak for Kevin, but I think I could. In saying that, to to our way of thinking, they were just tails. Yeah, and we we drew them as tails, and they were tails. And you know, it's only when people started pointing out, well, you know, that kind of looks like a penis or a turd or something, right? Um, that it, you know, it became clear to us that well, maybe maybe other people don't see it the same the way we do, but we all saw them as tails, like I said. Were you conscious of the violence in the comic? Like like the last page, we saw some turtles bleeding and, you know, we're starting to see the black ink for blood. Uh, was that something you guys were thinking of? Because, I mean, 1984, I don't know how violent comics are at the time. Miller was known for his violent da- daredevils, and, and there was uh, be backlash. And, you know, this is pretty good right here, a good example. Yeah, there, there was, uh, if, if I'm remembering correctly, um, there was quite a bit of violence in the comics of that era. Um, and we didn't try to go, go over the top with it. I mean, the, uh, there's no entrails spilling out on the ground and nobody loses their head or, you know, stuff like that. Um, we, we wanted to have a, what, what you could probably can compare to a, a Bruce Lee movie, that kind of level of violence and, and more, more violent action than violence per se. And there's and there's not much, no real swearing or anything either. When that was that was an opportunity, like you, like you could have. And I think this is like one of those comics that people would describe. They they call ground level, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. It, it's almost you know superhero adjacent, like all the kind of similar rules, except mm-hmm. you do got some blood and things in here. It definitely lends itself to the ink treatment. Yeah, you know we were talking about the duo shade looking so good with the textures and the turtle skin. And when I mm. see like cuts and blood droplets, it mm. lends itself to the material really well. Mm. When when you guys were writing this thing, did you spend a lot of time at the, at that stage? Do do several drafts because like we're getting to the end here, and there really is. There's three tight acts. Everything pays off. You introduce Oroko Saki early, for you know, in enough time to like get that mask knocked off so that we get to see beyond a shadow of a doubt who, who Shredder is. It's mm-hmm. really tightly written. Hmm. So would you, the, the question is, would you, um, was there a, a, a lot of attention paid to the scripting part before you started putting pencil to paper? Well, it depends on how you define a lot of. Um, Say several, little- several passes of, of, of draft. Yeah. Would that happen? Um, I, I honestly can't really remember exactly, but my what I can remember of that process was that 
and this actually held true of most of the books that we did together, was that we, we would first just talk the story out um, and determine what was going to happen in, in the issue. And then Kevin would go and do his uh, layouts. And then we'd get back together and look at them and determine whether the, everything was working. And it usually was. I, I rarely remember changing stuff at that stage. Um, and then Kevin would, or actually Kevin would, as he was doing them, kind of write the dialogue notes or story notes in the, on the, the side of each page or on the back. And then I would take his notes and kind of clean them up a little bit and maybe add a few things here and there. Then we talk about what I had done, if it, was, if it met what he wanted to do on, on, the, on the book. And then it would go to directly to lettering. But I can't remember if we, we did too much revision in, in that first issue. I, you know, we were so excited about doing it. We just wanted to crank it out and, and do, it, do the best we could, but get it done quickly. And, and this comic is a consequence. You know, it's a famous story. Uh, but correct me if I'm not mistaken, the, com the comic you guys were working on when the Ninja Turtles concept comes up, you guys are mm -hmm. doing the Fugitoid comic that came out. Like, you were correct. working on that. Yeah, we so. were, and, and we had actually done that Fugitoid um, comic in the in a form that we were thinking would be really fun to print it, would be, which would be a, a sort of poster comic. I don't know if you remember seeing these back in the day. They'd had them for Star Trek and Star Wars and all kinds of other popular properties. They would be, a, a, I think, an eight and a half by eleven form. But what it would be is when you open it once, you get two pages, and then you open it a third time or a second time, and you get like a big poster, right? Like a seven by twenty-two poster, and th which is why when you look at the Fugitoid comic, there's there's a big page, and then um, a, a regular page, and then a regular page, and then a regular page, and then another big page, and the big pages would be where we're what we were thinking would be the poster. But it never happened. I like it because that speaks to innovation. Like you, like you guys are are, you know, trying to come up with something that we haven't seen before. I had a Hulk comic yeah, I, like I that. Remember, I can't remember if there were any comics done quite like that. You well, recall? I have a uh, a Hulk comic like that, and it's a tie into the Hulk TV show. So maybe oh. you know, like the Star Wars and Star Trek. I, I never saw those, but I wonder if this was something that was coming out of Hollywood. Is like poster on one side, fold it up into a comic and sell it on newsstands, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, like a kind of like a comic book or a magazine. As we're wrapping up this issue, just got to point out some more of the beautiful technique that is employed with, using the duotone where you have this lighting from the city streets and, and it's severe. Like they just knocked this guy off the roof and it's almost like the turtles are like illumination is coming from, you know, his soul leaving his body or something. <laughs> And that underlighting on the turtles, that is sexy drawing right That's there. That's a great panel all around. And this this interesting sky approach, we're using both developers, you know, using a dark gray developer and using the light gray where you just get the one set of lines. And it just creates this great flow to, your uh, to just... Your interpretation of that panel where the turtles are on the edge of the rooftop is, is interesting because that, that effect, and maybe this is pointing out how... We didn't really know what we were doing that well. Um, that's supposed to be the explosion that kills the shredder. Ah. I guess we didn't do it quite quite well. <laughs> Listen, looks 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 great. Got that last page, dude. Iconic ending, the mm -hmm. end, no to be continued. This could be one yeah. and done. Yeah. This could be that's it. Uh, having you know that I, I the. Barbaric fantasy comic that I'd sent you in the calendar of the gods. Oh, um, yes, these guys right here. Yeah. Uh, working on those two projects had taught me that it's not very easy to sell what you do. Yeah. Um, unless you're really good and you really have uh, something that's really very appealing. And so when Kevin and I did the first Turtle comic, I, we, we both actually really thought we'd be sitting on boxes of them for, for a year or more. 
maybe maybe longer, maybe several years. Um, and we were totally shocked that they sold out as quickly as they did. Yeah, uh, if I remember right from from the interviews we've read, like uh, you you sold out of these comics thanks to you know various distributors and things uh, before the print run even hit your door. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, amazing. And with something like this, you said you print about five hundred of these guys. I believe so. Yeah, sold about a hundred. So, like that lets the people know that, you know, this thing was a hit from the start. And this, yeah, definitely. Peter, how soon do you guys go into working on issue two after you finish this first one? Well, uh, what happened was uh, we finished the first one and, and premiered it at that convention in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in, in the beginning of May, I think May 4th or 5th. Um, and at that time, uh, neither Kevin nor I were making much money. And uh, so we had to go where the money was. And in my case, it was it meant going with my wife to where she found a new teaching job. And that was in Connecticut. And uh, well, we ended up living in Sharon, Connecticut. I can't remember where the school was that she taught. It was nearby, probably about five or six miles away. But we had to, we had to do that. So uh, we basically said goodbye to Kevin. He went back to Maine. And as it happened, and you know, again, we were so grateful for this. Um, that first printing of three thousand, actually three thousand two hundred and seventy-five, because they overprinted a little bit. Um, that sold out so quickly that we realized, wow, you know, uh, and there wasn't uh, there was not, not much effort on our part to to do that. It seemed like the the distributors came to us very quickly and uh, wanted more. So we did the next printing of 6,000 while we were still in Maine. I mean, it's still in New Hampshire. And then um, I ended up in, in Sharon, Connecticut, and Kevin was back in um, Agunquit, Maine, I believe, or maybe he went back to Port, Port, Port London. I can't recall for sure. But what, what became pretty clear is that this, was, this had some legs and people wanted it. And, you know, much, much, in much greater numbers than we ever could imagine. Um, and I was handling the business aspect of, of um, the business, uh, you know, dealing with distributors and so forth, and uh, the printer down in, down in Connecticut. And I crunched the numbers and I got all excited and I called Kevin up. And this was back in the day when calling long distance was pretty expensive. So it had to be a, an important call. I called them up and I said, Kevin, you're not going to believe this. I just crunched the numbers up for issue two. And we're each going to make $2,000, clear $2,000 on this one comic book, this first printing, which for us was fantastic. Because that was that record, that um, that was basically about a third of, or a quarter of what I made per year as an illustrator. Um, but really, the, the impetus to do a second issue came pretty quickly after the first one, because it, the response to it was so positive. Um, it was, and it really surprised the hell out of us. Um, but we, we loved it. You know, it was like, wow, this, is, this, this might actually be something that, that won't be a flash in the pan. And um, it wasn't. You know, we, we basically started working on that second issue through the mail. And Kevin, I think, came down to, to visit me in, in Connecticut once or twice. So we were able to get a lot more work done on the second issue. Um, and it, it basically carried on from there. You know, we, we sold, I think, I think the first printing of the second issue was 15,000 copies. Um, and I think we did a uh, second printing of that book relatively quickly after that. But at, at that point, I, I know I've, I've seen Kevin tell the story in, in various interviews, and I have too. That was really the moment when we, when we knew something great had happened for us, you know, that we were doing comic books and we were getting paid, you know, we could eat, you know, and, and live off these comic books that we were doing that we absolutely loved working on. 
and it was just fantastic. Here's, here's a technical question. I'm just curious about uh, reprints in the, in the 1980s because now it's we take it so for granted uh, because everything's digitally based and, you know, we send off files, digital files to, to a print house and all we have to do is hit them up again and say, hey, man, like dust these off, hit, hit the print yeah. button. Would you have to like revisit these facilities with film and stuff or would these print houses hang on to f film of everything they printed and it was an easier go? Because uh, I'm thinking about the Zap Comics guys would mm. get the masters made of Zap Comics and hold on to them. Right. They would use various publishers, and it was their way of keeping everybody honest so that they don't run off a couple extra or whatever. So they would have to be the ones to uh, deliver the actual materials to, to the, the printer. Do, do, you, do you remember how that part worked, the, the reprints? Yeah, well, it's been a while, so it's a little blurry. Sure. Um, mm. But I remember that when we did the first issue, we had a we found a printer in Summersworth, New Hampshire, which is, I think, the next town north of Dover where we're living, and we basically put together a, a dummy using Xerox copies to show exactly where the, the pages should go in order. Yeah, um, and we gave that to them, and and I think. I think that that was basically what we gave them, and then we gave them, um, I believe, good Xerox copies of the toned artwork. I don't think we gave them the actual toned artwork to shoot from, um, and so they they did they took that and ran with it and did did the first print run of, of the the first issue, and then in this for the second issue we basically, um, I think we changed a couple of things. I think we may have changed the inside back cover. And I know we put um, the word second printing. You can, in fact, you can see it here. I don't know if you mm -hmm. can see that. Um, and that was it. We basically gave them those two, cha two changes. And they, I, I imagine they took what they already had for the rest of the book and just, you know, went with it. Um, and for a long time, that was that was how we did the uh, interface with the printers. Um, we had uh, we found a printer in Lakeville, Connecticut, when we were in Connecticut, and they did issue two, three, the Raphael micro series, and issue four, I think. And then we found another printer in New York State, in Poughkeepsie, actually. Um, and they did the all the issues from that that point on um, for quite a while. Um, and I, I, I've lost my train of thought again. Sorry, guys. Think about that part also. Like, there's no internet, so you gotta like use yellow pages only extend so far. So how the heck do you even find a printer in Poughkeepsie, Poughkeepsie if you're not there? Like, there's man, it's well, actually, we lucked out on that one because somebody had found an issue, a copy of the turtle book and brought it to the printer in Poughkeepsie and said, you should, you should look these guys up and, and see if you can get their, their business. And in fact, that's what happened. Uh, we wow. got a call from one of the salespeople that worked at the printer and <laughs> it was actually quite, quite a wonderful time for us because prior to hooking up with that printer we had done all the packing and shipping of all the comics ourselves in our basement and uh it was, it was a pain in the butt let me tell you um and it was so cool because the, the, this new printer this new guy from the new printer said oh we'll do that for you all you gotta do is send us a list of you know where to drop ship to and you know the way we'll go and uh, that turned out to be a, a fantastic improvement in how we put the comics together i'm sure man Le alleviate some of that time but like <laughs> well, let's let's have that conversation on uh shoot yes. interview man peter thank you so much for joining us uh to go through these teenage mutant ninja turtle uh one one pages uh if little eddie piscor was to know what would happen in the future man you with, got that right with peter laird like he would not freaking believe it uh thank you thank you so much and and thanks for for uh your contribution to this medium you kicked down uh, a lot of doors that me and jimmy just get to walk through uh quite easily man and it wouldn't have happened uh without 
you and the, and the work that you've done over the years. Uh, I, I can say for Kevin and myself, thank you very much for that.